Okay, I started in 1959 in uh, Morristown uh, Missile and Surface Radar System. Uh, worked on the uh, BMUSE program, uh, which uh, was a very interesting project because it was uh, all, everybody had a demand required overtime, uh, at least 20% overtime a week. And what amazed me is the factory-like engineering because there were four desks, desk here, desk here, phone in the middle, and then an aisle, then another one, and then an aisle, then another one, and an aisle, and then it went this way, this way, and this way. I mean, hundreds, literally hundreds of engineers in this big building, row after row after row. Um, very noisy environment because people were always talking and phones ringing. But it got the job done, and uh, but that was my first experience into uh, RCA. And I thought, boy, this is really a factory system system of engineering. And uh, was that good or bad? I think it was good. One of the things I learned is how to put noise out of my mind, mm -hmm. background noise, so I could concentrate better, and it served me well over the years. Did you have any mentors or anybody to uh, help you along there? No, not really. Yeah, you're, you had your supervisor, your, your team leader, mm -hmm. and that was about it. And he sat off onto the side uh, in his little uh, cubicle. And, um, but, you know, we had a laboratory in which we could uh, do our prototypes and things like that. But Bemuse was a terrific success. It worked perfectly. Um, in fact, some people may remember uh, the uh, big golf ball that sat next to the turnpike. Uh, that was the BMU system. Uh, so after, after all this went on, uh, BMU's design was over, the installation support was over, and a whole bunch of us got laid off. Yeah, you know, this is the scenario. You had these big contracts, you bring a bunch of people in, you form the contract and then you lay people off. Uh, this was, uh, so I got laid off. Best thing that ever happened to me. I immediately got a job in advanced technology laboratories, which then was called applied research. Uh, and uh, that uh, was the greatest job I think I've ever had. Uh, we, I pretty quickly got into doing research on lasers and more, more important, laser applications. Uh, worked a lot with the uh, Sarnoff Laboratories to develop some of the uh, lasers. We focused primarily on laser diodes. As a matter of fact, uh, our laboratory had the first demonstration of room temperature laser dye operations. Before that, it was all cryogenic, you know, 77 degrees kind of uh, temperature of operation. The, um, so that was a major, major breakthrough in laser diodes. Because laser diodes today are all over the place, you know. Uh, every DVD and CD uses a laser diode. Uh, and... Uh, they're all, you know, in all the fiber optic communications, laser diodes. So that first development of room temperature operation, now it was pulsed at the time only, but pretty soon thereafter we were able to get to continuous operation at room temperature. That was another major breakthrough that us working with the laboratories at Sarnoff uh, got through. Um, it sounds like your work environment was different from the BMUSE experience. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> we had, uh, you know, much smaller uh, cubicles to work in. Uh, we had uh, very nice laboratory facilities. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was, it's much, it was much nicer. To, you had a closer organization. You had access to very, very broad brush of skilled people. 
you know, practically every technology you could think of uh, was available there, in, including maser development, which people have never even heard of now, but it was the first of the very low noise uh, receivers for space communications. Uh, and, of course, lasers, uh, um, thermoelectric devices, a major development going there along with the labs. Mm -hmm. And that proved very valuable into a lot of space-based work uh, because what they are, are you put electric in, you get cooling on one side and heat on the other side, and it's all solid state. So, uh, for small cooling systems, very, very valuable. And where were you located now? Located in building 10, mm -hmm. 8th floor. Okay. Yeah, I remember because lots of times I used to walk up to the 8th floor, which is quite a jog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of firsts in the laser development. The first room temperature laser diet, as I said. The first laser communications uh, army contract for point-to-point -point battlefield communications that was secure and not visible. Uh, we had uh, the first sun pump laser where uh, designed for space applications and communications where you use the energy of the sun directly to pump the laser. So you had virtually no electronics other than the modulation that comes to modulate the light output. Um, that was a, a major first. We had the first uh, laser tracking system. Uh, we also developed a laser tracker that could go onto a radar tracker. Uh, the radar tracker only had so much resolution in terms of tracking capability. And when you got to that point, you needed more resolution, you switched to lasers. And you put down the, the accuracy by, by um, 10 to 1. So it was an amazing uh, accomplishment in terms of uh, accuracy performance. Uh, we also did, uh, you've all, I don't know, maybe a lot of you have heard of the Hellfire uh, laser designation system for uh, providing uh, uh, missiles designated to a specific target. Uh, they're called smart weapons today. Uh, that, we, we had some major success in terms of developing some of the uh, 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 silicon detectors that were used in the front end for that. Uh, we also had some army contracts to advance the capability of that in terms of providing for better precision and better wider fields of view. Field of view is important because if you had a narrow field of view, that's all the seeker could get into. You know, it had to be in there. Whereas you could open the wider field of view, then the seeker didn't have too much of a problem getting to the right location. Mm -hmm. um, we did, in advanced technology, all the suit designs that the astronauts did on the moon. Uh, if in terms of all the temperature, you know, temperature control in the moon on the suit, even in space, is a tremendous problem. Because you happen to be in the shade of something, the temperature drops. Or even the sun, temperature goes way up. So the, and by a lot, by a very, very significant amount. So the temperature control of those suits were uh, very, very important. And they did that via thermoelectrics, uh, developed at ATL, and uh, also using um, um, wax to store the energy, because wax has a very high latent heat of, of uh, melting uh, that allows you to take the heat, take the heat out of it, put the heat back into it as, as necessary. So we were very involved with that, uh, that development. Um, we also did the first uh, laser image recording. And as a matter of fact, the first uh, uh, 
satellite uh, weather systems, which communicated weather, weather images uh, of the Earth. Uh, they had much better resolution than most recorders here on Earth could produce images of. So we developed a laser image recorder system that had tremendous resolution and could support that. So we actually did the first high resolution uh, image recording uh, from space on the weather satellite. One of the uh, early uh, imaging satellites was called Earth's Earth Resources Satellite Technology, I think it was. Uh, that was, and you probably may have seen some of these images. They're false colors. In other words, the color is reversed so you could identify things better. Uh, we did the first recordings of those and actually produced a number of recorders that were sold to NASA, uh, the weather systems, uh, the Army, the Air Force. Um, we had quite a little business going in terms of uh, image recorders. Uh, a lot of uh, very, very secure systems where, you know, if I, I can't tell you about it because I have to kill you kind of thing. And you know about that, sir. Yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> so how many years did you spend at ATL? I spent from 63 to uh, 76. Okay. So 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then I moved into the operational base of Camden, uh, into uh, the communication systems, more specifically for recording systems. Mm -hmm. And that's where we did a lot of laser recorders. Uh, we also did uh, a lot of advanced designs in terms of uh, recording capability, both uh, for, on magnetic tape uh, and also optical disc. Little known because people don't react to RCA and DVDs or CDs, uh, particularly the ones that you can re-record or record once. It's because RCA made a decision not to go into that business. Although we had all the technology developed. And as a matter of fact, Sony and uh, Mashisita, Panasonic, uh, paid Camden some major royalties. Uh, and it was actually uh, one of the largest uh, Camden uh, profit benefits for a number of years from those patents. So RCA was really, did all the groundwork on those things. Um, While you're doing all of this work, what about your co-workers? What was it like? It was great. Uh, RCA noted themselves as a family company. And as a matter of fact, most companies, you know, you can't hire your your nephew or your brother or something like that. RCA was the opposite. They encouraged that. You know, the philosophy was that if you're the nephew, brother, cousin, whatever, you're going to want to make sure you're doing a better job because you don't want that feeding back to your family, uh, what a lousy job Joe is doing. Um, so uh, RCA encouraged that, and I thought that was good. Uh, I thought that uh, RCA had a very much of a can-do attitude. Uh, somehow, some way, we'll get the job done. As a matter of fact, most, 99% of the cases we did. Uh, fighting against some amazing schedules. Uh, and you can only do that when you have the people who work there molding themselves together as a team uh, and working together, not for personal benefit, but to make the program successful. This term... And in a lot of cases, you know, layoffs were so predominant. When I first went to Camden in 1963, I think there were 12,000 people that worked there. When I left in 94, there were 1,200. Uh, so there were constant layoffs. And that was a real negative. Um, 
I think once the general uh, Sarnoff left as CEO, uh, the company went downhill. Mm -hmm. Largely because Bob Sarnoff, his son, wanted to invest into all kinds of things other than the fundamental RCA technology and manufacturing capability. Um, he wanted to buy Banquet Foods, Hertz Rent-A-Car, uh, Carnet Carpet, and so on and so forth, you know. And bought them for cash, not even mergers, for cash. And just sucked all the resources out of the company. Um, in addition to that, you had to justify everything nine times from Sunday before you got a project going. Uh, at the at the RCA level. Uh, noted for that was the video disc. Uh, video disc, you smile, so you remember that. The video disc was uh, one of the first video recording systems, or video playing systems, excuse me. It was not recording. Video playing systems, where you could buy a video disc and plug it into your player, and you could watch two hours of of movies, or whatever was on the on the uh, video disc, um, that was first demonstrated in the late '60s. Um, Sarnoff worried about Bobby Sarnoff worried about whether that was um, a good thing to invest into, and then he decided he would. Then he changed his mind, and he decided he wasn't. And then uh, he finally decided he would. And so they, they, they had a plant in Indianapolis, so they moved all their capability there uh, to start manufacturing. Uh, in the meantime, he got fired. To, he had a RCA board uh, revolt to uh, get him out of there. And they replaced him with Conrad. I can't remember his Conrad's name. Maybe it's David Conrad. I don't remember his first name. And uh, he took a look at the video disc and decided, eh, let me look at it for a while. And uh, so another three or four years went by and uh, finally decided, yeah, let's go with it. Uh, in the meantime, this is a parallel track, which I'll talk about, and I'll get back to it in a minute. But let me go off track and start something else. Uh, the uh, RCA also developed a magnetic tape recorder that had a cassette that you could plug into the tape recorder and you could play up to two hours of video recording. You could record the video and play it back. So off your TV, you could record whatever you wanted and then play it back at some other time uh, that you prescribed. So this was a major breakthrough because the first time ever you could record TV programs. Um, well, like normal, uh, turned it over to RCA Manufacturing and said, okay, see what you can do to manufacture this design. They had several prototypes already done. And they said, um, okay, take a look at it. And, uh, oh, by the way, it's going to cost $2,500 to manufacture it. What? Well, we can't get it any cheaper. We looked at it nine ways from Sunday, and we can't figure out how to uh, uh, get it any cheaper. You know, the, the mechanics in the head is so complex and so many pieces to it that it takes a lot of labor and a lot of parts uh, just to make that happen. So one of our um, entrepreneurial engineers uh, decided to see what he could do to pedal it around the world to see if he could get it made cheaper. He ended up in Japan talking to Mushisada, who you all probably know as Panasonic. And Panasonic took a look at the design and the models and said, uh, yeah, we can do it. We can do it for less than a thousand dollars. Now, the way manufacturing and sales go, it's like two to one. 
whatever your manufacturing cost is, your sales cost is, in, in new products like that, it's generally going to be like two to one. So that means they could sell for under $2,000. Major breakthrough. And the market, if you get it down into the $1,000 category, you have a market that's way open. So what Mishisita did is not go to the normal manufacturing techniques, but developed a whole robotic system to put this magnetic uh, uh, transport together. And so it was a, no hands actually touched the manufacturer of this. And that's how they get the cost down. This was the difference between energetic uh, ways of solving problems. You know, what's your big hang up? Figure out how do you can get around the hang up. And that's what Mishisita did. RCA, by this time, had gotten very bureaucratic, and that's why they couldn't see uh, you know, the ways of getting around it. Plus the fact that Japan had a little bit lower cost uh, of, of operation. So this became known as the VHS. Uh, VHS, is that right? Yeah. VHS. Uh, VCR, I'm sorry, VCR, video, VTR? Video cassette recorder. Video, yeah, VCR, video cassette recorder. The format was VHS. Yeah. Which served the, uh, the world for a number of decades until uh, DVD, recordable DVDs came out, uh, and also solid state recording. Um, but RCA made a fortune on it. Uh, on the uh, VCR. But that's just now. Let me come back to the video disc. By playing around with decisions not to go into manufacturing on the video disc, time went on, a whole decade went on, in fact, almost 12 years. If they had come out first with that when they could have, they would have beat the video cassette recording capability. And that would have never even been an object. Because at that point, we probably would have figured out how to do recording on optical disc as well. Anyway, the... Um, Coming back the to the RCA, RCA family. family. Yeah. RCA promoted this uh, from the very beginning. And one of the things that the General Sarnoff, uh, who was the first CEO of RCA, uh, he didn't need a lot of marketing analysis, technology analysis, he knew when a product had the capability of making money. And, you know, he says, just make it happen. And you didn't have to do a lot of uh, uh, analysis and projects and future projections and things like that for him. And that's why he did, you know, development of television from its infancy. Uh, radio transmitters with very high power. Uh, just says, make it happen. And the engineers could make it happen. Uh, color TV. He says, just make it happen. Uh, so with that kind of authority, things went on and, you know, uh, we uh, made things happen. Mm -hmm. But he also projected a concept of, we're a team, we're a family, we can make things happen together. You and me together can make things happen. And that was just a tremendous psychological influence in terms of getting things done. Because when you're working with your family, you do things better. You do things in a kinder way. Uh, many, too many companies had this, who struck John, you know, I'm not going to put my neck out. And uh, there was none of that. You know, if you put your neck out and you're wrong, oh well, let's go on and fix it. Uh, that kind of attitude left people making decisions and going forward rather than being afraid to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Making decisions, people think of making a decision as, you know, the big CEO making a decision to do something or the big manager. Decisions come down to every day in 
the world of technology, every day is a, is you're making hundreds of decisions. What is the decision to use that component or this component? That design versus this design? Uh, do I interface this way or do I interface that way? And there are decisions that can be troublesome if you have fear of making them. So consequently, you spend more time trying to decide whether that's the right decision or not, as opposed to making the decision and getting on with it. More than likely, you're going to be right. That had a tremendous capability in terms of our, of our performance. And with that, you know, you do better on schedules, you do better on design performance and the capability of the product. Talk about your supervisors. Good and bad. You know, like any place in the world, I had one supervisor, which he was, this is an ATL. He was, I won't mention his name, but he was the worst supervisor I ever had. And he, uh, he would tell you, come in, he'd call you into his office and say, okay, now explain this, explain that. Well, how can we do this? And how can we do that? Just the opposite of the family attitude that I was talking about. And he would criticize you for little bitty things which didn't matter. You know, whether you did A or B doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But he would spend, I'd spend two hours in his office going through A or B, you know, which was a decision you could make in two minutes. Uh, and he was not even nice. I mean, he was very dictatorial. He was very, uh, he looked down on you, you know, like you subservient you. How dare you even cross-examine me or say back to me? So um, I, I really got to hate this guy. Mm -hmm. And then... One day I was driving into work, I said, you know, this can't go on. I have to find something in this guy to like. So next time I was in his office, he had a nice tie on. So I said, Don, that's, tell, that's a nice tie, think of that. That's something nice about him. And the next time I thought of something else. Each time I went back, I thought of something else that was nice about him. Eventually, we got to pass all this garbage, and we got to be fairly close. At that point, he was fired for his performance, and I felt bad for him. Uh, instead of feeling, yeah, he's out, I felt bad for him. So that's just a little indication of, you know, how that family attitude comes around. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right. um, now, I had another boss, mm -hmm. Don Parker, who I know you know. Uh, he was a great boss. If you didn't need anything from him, don't bother him. Uh, if you need help, go to him. He'll find help. Great boss. Our, is a, I worked for him the longest of any boss in, in RCA. Uh, just a great guy. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But, you know, great statistician, great technologist, great strategy in terms of him. And he was a good people person. Mm -hmm. um, also an ex-ATLer. Ex-ATL, right. Several inferences of RCA changing South Jersey have come up. Do you have any opinions on that? Um, it certainly changed Camden, that's for sure. Um, I mean, Camden was a majority manufacturer and um, uh, employer in the whole South Jersey area. Uh, between Campbell Soup and RCA, uh, you know, it was a lion's share of employment in South Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Campbell Soup, uh, which had, uh, you know, imported all kinds of vegetables, and in including tomatoes, <laughs> uh, 
During the tomato season, they used to bring these huge trucks in just filled with tomatoes. And sometimes the truck would turn a little fast on, this, on the corner and a bunch of tomatoes would land on the street. You smell tomatoes for quite a while. <laughs> um, but Campbell Soup decided to stop the production of their vegetables and their soup products in Camden and moved out to other parts of the country. Uh, major loss in employment there. As I indicated before, it was 1,200 people, 12,000 people worked in Camden when I first went there. And as it died down to 1,200 when I left in 94, uh, you know, that is huge in terms of the amount of employment. Consequently, the Camden city itself nosedived uh, into uh, uh, depression and and uh, people moved out as, as decay uh, crept in. Uh, and so Camden's a, you know, almost a ghost town nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, filled with all kinds of crime and yeah. you know, every week there's a fire someplace. From your perspective, what was the best thing about working for RCA? The ability to get things done and the people I had to work with, and, and being able to advance the technology. I loved working with new technology mm -hmm. and moving technology from the labs to a product. And that was just very motivating. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever associate with your coworkers outside of work? Not very often. Mm -hmm. There were a few now and then, but not, not really. Uh, one of the more unusual ones is my secretary I had for a number of years. Uh, she became a very good friend, and we had her over our house for dinner a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, uh, there, is another, there is an association that is kind of interesting. I think it goes back to 1955. There was a poker game that met once a month in various houses, you know, where it's, it rotated, and, uh, and, and with the individuals that played. And they were all RCA people. Um, I think almost all Camden people. And uh, so you'd rotate around the individual players' houses, and that... Uh, Game went on and on and on, and it finally dissipated about two, three years ago. Do you have any anything to say on the RCA celebrations, parties, etc.? You mean like Christmas parties? Mm -hmm. uh, they were fun. Uh, we used to have a Christmas party every year. And, why, of course, you bring your wives and things like that. And you got to talk to people outside the work environment and got to know them a little bit better personally. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there was a little bit too much drinking going on. Uh, and people said things that they later on regretted having said. But in general, it was good. It, it helped promote this family attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was costly to put these things on, but I think they're all worth it in terms of uh, elevating the attitude and, and professionalism of the company. Mm -hmm. um, we used to periodically have uh, summer getaways to some lake someplace uh, to have a good summer kind, kind of time frame and get together on outside. And that was kind of nice and fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so, how do you, uh, how would you overall sum up your career at RCA? Just a job? Oh, no. Not a good journey? No, no, no. It was a lifetime experience. Uh, going from one technology to another. Um, uh, it was part of me. It became part of me. Uh, and my wife can attest to the fact that I spent way too much time at work. 
uh, largely to maintain schedules, uh, get things done, make things work right, uh, meet specifications. Uh, but, you know, I loved it. It was, uh, and, and part of the love of it, it was being able to work with good people who got things done and wanted to get things done. Uh, a lot of people, it was much more than just a job. They were there to make things happen. And that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so it was a real lifetime experience that I just loved. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't Monday morning, oh, i got to go to work. It was Monday morning, I'm going to go to work. You know, I can do more things again. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so, yeah. What was it like to retire? I didn't retire. I got laid off after 37 years. And uh, which is the best thing that ever happened to me because I uh, did a, did, I've been working ever since and doing really great work, uh, great projects. And uh, I went on to help hospitals go from film-based operations to electronic-based operations. I worked with many, many hospitals around the country. Um, and then to where I presently am doing, where I'm developing the, uh, uh, a new imaging technology for medical applications, where it's uh, focused right on imaging cancer. So uh, the first product, which is now in FDA trials, is for breast cancer. And uh, the initial performance is outstanding in terms of any other applications that's out there in terms of uh, imaging technology to be able to detect cancer. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a technology I, I breathed life into and managed the whole operation for it. So. Okay, now RCA was essentially acquired by GE. Yes. Did you notice any change in the environment? Uh, what's your opinions of that? Yeah, major changes in environment. Uh, one of the first things they did is to uh, get rid of layers of management, which I thought was good. Uh, you know, I think they had uh, only four tiers from the base of those who do to the general manager uh, or the vice president or whatever it happened to be. And I thought that was good because I think we had way too many layers of management. Uh, however, they also brought an attitude that any manager could manage any operation if you were GE trained. And that was a catastrophe because this any manager can manage any operation attitude coming into the family kind of structure that we had just was a clash like this and caused all kinds of operational inefficiencies, destruction of capabilities, uh, people leaving, other people. You know, they brought a massive amount of GE people into Camden. Uh, uh, who knew nothing about the operations or the attitude or the personality of the operation. And that was very disruptive. And I don't think it ever got fixed. So, um, what about our customers? How did they view G uh, RCA? You know, RCA and electronics were almost synonymous in the 30s and 40s. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Defense, or Department of War, as it was known at that time, wanted to move a lot of the RCA skills out of uh, the East Coast into uh, deeper into the country because they're concerned about, uh, you know, some catastrophe happening and all that technology being and capability being lost. Uh, so, a lot of places were moved inland. 
uh, further. Um, but, you know, RCA, you know, in terms of, they built almost all the communication capability uh, uh, during World War II. Uh, a lot of other electronics in terms of uh, uh, radar. Um, and uh, I guess radar and communications were the, were the major things. Um, now, as, as we go out past World War II, uh, more and more companies started to get developed, and, and a lot of spin-offs from RCA. Uh, you know, the Motorola, the Philco's, you know, all the old TV manufacturers were all spin a lot of spin-offs from, from RCA, where guys who had capabilities uh, moved out of RCA into these other companies to help promote their capabilities and technologies. Uh, so they started a lot of uh, technology uh, competition, um, and RCA uh, slowly uh, lost the lead of, you know, being synonymous with electronics. Although they certainly were the forefront of developing TV and uh, and also color TV, uh, there was a major battle uh, between. What was the format for TV uh, before it came out? And uh, the uh, FCC had to make a determination as to what format. RCA proposed one, and I think it was Philco, but I'm not sure, proposed another one. Uh, it was more of a spinning filter uh, that the Philco had, if it was Philco. In RCA, it was purely electronics. Um, although the actual performance by the other company was a little bit better. But the RCA approach had a lot more capability to evolve and get better in its performance. Anyway, RCA won the format, which left RCA to be in a ground position in terms of um, Broadcast technology, broadcast market. They own the broadcast market, uh, not only in this country, but worldwide. Um, and gradually, they let the competition get ahead of them because they weren't investing into it, whereas competition was investing in technology. And so they gradually lost more and more business. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the broadcast business was the recording of television programs, which is a major thing. Uh, initially, what they do is they record the TV images on film. So they had a film recording uh, of the TV program. They could play it back and transfer that through cameras into live broadcasts again. Uh, they were called Cinescope Recordings, I think. And they were pretty bad. Well, RCA developed a uh, magnetic tape recording capability which could record real-time television programs. Uh, and it had a certain format. So the world used that format uh, for recording the broadcasts. Uh, the Japanese and also RCA technology uh, both in the Sarnoff Labs and also in ATL and, and recording systems, developed what's called a, um, the one was called transverse, and the other was called, I just can't remember now. At any rate, uh, it was more of an elliptical recording capability where you could put a complete frame on one stripe. That was a major uh, breakthrough rather than putting four stripes uh, on one frame. Um, RCA decided in, now this is way past the Bobby Sarnoff, uh, decided, no, we don't, we own the format, we own this marketplace, we don't want to change. So we're not going to develop a product because our competition may hear wind of it. Um, the Japanese came out with one. Sucked up, sucked up the market 
immediately. Cheaper, better performance, smaller. Let's get back to uh, what does the what does the customers think of RCA? Okay. Uh, for a long while, over many many decades, until I would say the late seventies, uh, the customers thought RCA was almost a miracle worker in terms of uh, the capabilities that they had and what they could perform and do and provide. But then it started to slip. And uh, you know, many customers just came to RCA and said, this is what I need. You know, and we would generate the specifications for them and develop schedules and things like that. And uh, where a lot of times the customers normally have to do that kind of stuff. So um, we'd also go out and talk to customers and say, what's your problem? You know, what do you need to have solved? Mm -hmm. And we come back with solutions for them. Um, and they, they thought a lot of RCI. Um, and consequently, it, it took very little management to run the programs with RCI. And as RCI, as, as the GE started to come in and the top management started to uh, get very funny. Um, you know, the performance degraded. And there, pretty soon, customers spent more and more time at RCA making sure they did their job. So, top management makes a huge difference in terms of the performance of those underneath. The attitude, the personality, and the character at the top actually makes a huge difference at the lowest person on the bottom. And that attitude and, and determination and uh, intimacy with people makes all the difference in the world. Personality at the top is what the personality at the bottom becomes. Right. So it was a mix, depending on what era you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, just just as a example, uh, a Boeing Vertol in, in Philadelphia area uh, had a awarded contract for a heavy lift helicopter. So I said, "Well, they got a contract. Maybe they need some help from us." So I went over and started talking to some of their management and made a little presentation of the capability RCA has and things like that. Um, and they said, you know, we got two problems. Uh, one is uh, we haven't figured out how to be able to stabilize this helicopter. It has to be stabilized within one inch. Uh, and then be able to move from this stabilization of one inch over by one inch, and then over by one inch. Or we also wanted to hit the stick and be able to move at a very slow, constant rate, whatever direction you wanted to go. Uh, oh, and by the way, it's going to lift a lot of dust, so you have to be able to see through the dust. Uh, and oh, by the way, we ought to be able to see through the dust and manage the cargo, because that's what the heavy lift is supposed to do. It's supposed to go out to ships, pick up the cargo, land them on shore. So it was an army contract. And so I said, I can solve that problem for you. So we went back and we put our heads together and we came back with a solution. And we went over and I made the presentation in terms of how we were going to solve their problems. And they asked a bunch of questions, you know, well, how about this or how about that? And I says, well, we solved that problem by doing this. We solved that problem by doing that. So we had a contract that we put in place. Um, and in, I guess it was about nine months, we put the systems together that we can put into their prototype helicopter. And we flew it. And today they have inertial guidance capability that can stabilize the helicopter. Then you didn't have those capabilities. It had too much drift in it. But it's kind of eerie to see this huge helicopter 
just sitting in midair, not moving, just sitting there. And all the things they wanted to be able to move it over by an inch, it, it passed every specification. They loved us. Unfortunately, the Navy went to Congress and said, that's our job to unload the ships, not the Army. And so the, can't, the contract was never canceled. But again, no money was ever put into it. Mm. So it never got beyond the prototype. But that was, but you asked about how I liked my job or what I thought about the job and the people. This is a, an example, one example of how we went to a customer, solved their problem for them, how they didn't know how they were going to attack it, or where to even go about doing it. And they loved us for it. Mm -hmm. And they worked very closely with us. And, uh, but I also had a team back here that said, okay, we'll do it this way and that way. And they actually were able to implement it when I, you know, the architecture I laid out. 